I would like to talk a little on the econ in the industry and uh, for the calendar year 21 the GDP growth is expected to be in the range of 888 percent uh, however this needs to be seen with all the challenges that we are now looking at the global events the inflationary pressures that are coming in as well in the country and also the supply chain getting disrupted uh, due to various global events across the globe. So looking at the index of industrial production, it has registered a growth of 13.7% for the period from April 21 to Jan 22, as compared to a degrowth of 12% over the same period last year due to the limited impact of the third wave of the pandemic that we all went through. The escalations of the geopolitical conflict and uh, the accompanying sanctions also have had major impact on the global economic activities. Uh, not to mention, of course, the inflation and supply chain pressures which are rising amidst the heightened uh, volatility. Overall, headwinds on these fronts, including the uncertainty about the pandemic's trajectory, is leading to a muted economic environment. However, uh, what we see in India with the government's push towards infrastructure and some of these key sectors is expected to boost the core sector performance. I would like to move now uh, to the next slide, which will talk a little bit about the core sector performance and uh, cement as a sector. Uh, which is uh, weighing in about 5.4% in the core sector index has grown by about 9.6% when compared to the same period last year. Uh, the steel sector with a weight of about 17.9% to the index has grown marginally by over 4% as compared to the same period last year. Uh, coal production in the country is up by about 7.5% and the energy generation in India is up about 2.4% as compared to the corresponding period of the previous year. Now the core sector performance improved on a year on year basis because of the low base effect and the high contributions from steel, cement and the natural gas sectors. However, the risk of weakness remains on account of the surging commodity prices and elevated freight cost. Uh, Talking about the auto perform, automotive sector performance, I move to the next slide. And uh, here what you see on the next slide is the two-wheeler segment which continues to be impacted as we entered into 2022. The production for the month of Jan and uh, February was just about 3 million with a degrowth of close to 21% when compared to the same period last year. Uh, this uh, was mainly due to the stress in demand from the rural side as well as on the semi-urban economies as well. Uh, talking of commercial vehicles, we have seen a very strong uptick in the demand there in the production numbers as well. And we see commercial vehicles continue on the growth trajectory. Uh, on the Obviously, on account of the government's consistent effort in terms of structural and infrastructural reforms, uh, which is definitely pushing up uh, the demand in the fleet utilization levels as well. Now, this segment has registered a robust growth of 24%, uh, with close to 175,000 uh, units being manufactured uh, within the first two months of the year. Uh, while passenger vehicles, as you can see, grew marginally with just about 3%, uh, but we continue to see the production ramp up being affected due to the existing uh, semiconductor and the chip shortages which are still prevalent in the auto industry as such. Uh, talk of tractors, and we see that the agricultural uh, tractors, the production numbers are significantly down when compared to the same period last year. Uh, the delayed monsoons impacting cash flows and also the stress on the rural economy coupled with the higher base effect uh, of the previous year are some of the major attributable reasons that we see. Uh, so with all this, uh, let's, let me now take you through uh, how did the quarter go by for us. To summarize now, uh, you know, I'm pleased to share that in spite of the headwinds that we faced, uh, we were able to uh, consistently deliver our top line 
and the bottom line performance uh, for this quarter as well. And our revenues for the quarter stood at uh, 15,675 million, uh, which is a clear 19% growth when compared to the same period last year and 2.9% uh, when compared to the preceding quarter. Now, this was backed by the continuous business wins in the automotive technologies uh, and also the industrial space. Some of the business wins, particularly in the clutch uh, applications going into the commercial vehicles, we have been able to leverage and uh, uh, start supplies in the quarter, and that has helped to hold up the automotive technologies performances. Uh, industrial business, although some of the segments we did see the growth momentum, uh, but some sectors definitely were uh, let down, uh, considering the fact the two-wheelers which uh, and off-roads, which we also sell products through the industrial business, did not do well. That had an impact on the industrial business performance. Not to mention, of course, uh, the wind. Uh, a couple of our customers also had challenges on their export business which uh, you know dampened the demand in the first quarter resulting in uh, almost a flat growth rate in the industrial business for us so having said that uh, when one were to look at so where did the growth come from we did very well on our exports business and the growth momentum continued in our export business in this quarter which has helped to post a pretty good uh, top line performance as well uh, EBIT margins for the quarter was at 16.6% as compared to 13% for the first quarter of the current year, growing almost 360 uh, BPS on a year-on-year -year basis. Now, we were able to deliver resilient margins during the quarter due to some of the continued focus on the countermeasures that we had already deployed, also coupled with our improved business mix with exports coming in uh, stronger in the first quarter, that helped us to post better EBIT margins than the previous quarters, uh, preceding quarter as well. Now, our profit after tax margin for the quarter was at 13.2% as compared to 106 uh, for the same period last year. And uh, for the quarter, uh, the profit after tax stood at 207 crores. Uh, coming to free cash flow for the quarter, it was down mainly due to an increase in the working capital and higher capex spend. Now, the free cash flow for the quarter was at 208 million rupees compared to uh, a negative 208 million rupees compared to 2842 million rupees in the same period last year. Uh, we remain focused on our capital management strategy going forward for this year as well. Now, uh, during the quarter, Shaffler India also was included in the production-linked incentive scheme, and that has been one of the important milestones that we achieved in the quarter. Uh, you know, we have been chosen under the component champion incentive scheme, and the inclusion in this scheme will help us in the creation of economies of scale and the robust supply chains in the areas of advanced automotive technology products helping us to gain a competitive edge and drive export capacity as well. Uh, so we believe that the PLI scheme approval will be a catalyst for our mission of advancing conventional mobility as well as the e-mobility to sustain uh, towards sustainable mobility solutions going forward. Now, as you must know that during the year, Schaeffler India also embarked on the structured journey of ESG and has already made significant progress in the reduction of the carbon footprint. Now, we will continue to lead ahead in building a responsible organization for tomorrow. And, uh, you know, ultimately, some of our customers, particularly John Deere in particular, if I may take, uh, clearly appreciated the steps Schaeffler India Limited was taking in the direction of uh, moving towards carbon neutrality and uh, they awarded us with a sustainability award earlier this year. Uh, the award recognized us for the reduction in carbon footprint and also, uh, you know, our commitment towards addressing other sustainability targets that we are clearly focusing on and we will continue our efforts in the direction of sustainable manufacturing and sustainable business as well. As we move ahead, we are cautious of the constantly changing external environment. And uh, with the rising inflation and uncertainty surrounding, that is uh, surrounding the environment due to the ongoing geopolitical developments, both in the East and the West, 
uh, we tread cautiously going forward as well in business. I move to the next slide, some of the new business wins that I talked about already. I shared about that we have been nominated and we have started supplies on some of the clutch application business uh, for the automotive technologies, clearly addressing the BSX requirement as well as moving forward, um, you know, the business wins that we have secured in the wheel bearing and the clutch applications. Talking about the automotive after market, we introduced another product in the quarter. Uh, the wipers for the passenger vehicle segment and uh, the business wins for the front end auxiliary drive, the timing kit for passenger vehicle segments also was uh, another product that we brought to the market. Uh, talk about uh, range extension and penetration, we will continue on this journey on the automotive aftermarket as well. Coming into the industrial, here again we did gain some significant wins. Uh, particularly on our spherical roller bearings and uh, cylindrical roller bearings uh, and taper rollers in the off-road sector and a uh, few on the industrial automation segment, the sleeve ring business that we have secured as well as some in the raw material sector which are key to the industrial sectoral performance as such. So uh, to talk in detail about our performance, I move to the next slide uh, which will give us the business highlights for the first quarter. Now coming into this slide, uh, you know, our Q1 performance, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, the automotive technologies contributed close to about 39% of our revenues, as you can see on the pie chart. And uh, the industrial business had a contribution of about 37%, uh, leaving the exports, which inched up to 16%. And the automotive aftermarket stayed at about eight percent. Now uh, we talk of uh, you know very good balance between the auto and the industrial, and this is exactly what you see here coming out strongly for us, which uh, weathers well for us in, in, in a very highly volatile market situation. So looking at the numbers, what you see, uh, the first quarter we were able to po post fifteen thousand six hundred. 75 million rupees, which was a clear 2.9% over the preceding quarter and a 19% over the same quarter last year. Uh, and uh, the contribution within the first quarter performance, clearly automotive technologies, uh, which was uh, which grew almost 6.1% uh, over the last year, same quarter. Automotive aftermarket grew 15.5% over Q1 of 2021, and industrial performed 21.7%. Export, as you can see, was a phenomenal growth for us uh, at about 61.4% better than the same uh, quarter last year. So exports continues to, uh, you know, um, hold up the numbers for us as well. And when you look at the bridge, uh, the contributions that have come in across uh, the bridge below clearly explains uh, uh, the, the, the uh, split between the business areas uh, between Q121 and the Q122. Talking about on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, the growth momentum continued. Uh, you know, the automotive technologies and even the e-mobilities, which contribute about 3% of our sales. Um, while we continue to invest on the future mobility solutions and also augment our R&D competencies, you know, also trying to bring in the Shackler knowledge and the group know-how uh, into India, uh, you know, we see that the industrial business, the growth remains flat for us during the quarter, mainly due to the demand, lower demand coming in from wind, which I already talked about, the two wheelers and the off-road segment, which actually pulled down the industrial part of the business. So the first quarter seasonally week uh, for the automotive aftermarket business, uh, coming on the back of a high uh, last quarter performance, and uh, this coupled with a higher base effect, which was there already there in Q4, as you know. However, we are confident uh, on gaining the traction here, helped by our focused efforts, and also the launch of the new products, which we will continue to sustain, uh, plus the network expansion, which we clearly have on our strategy plans, and uh, also work on improving the effectiveness of our distribution. And with that, uh, we have come to the, we move to the next slide, talking about uh, the earnings quality and uh, the EBIT for the first quarter uh, was uh, 260.2 crores, uh, bringing in an EBIT margin of 
16.6%, which was a clear 6.2% over the preceding quarter and a 52.4% better than the same quarter last year. Uh, having talked about it, uh, as you can see, the EBIT bridge below explains uh, the split on where did the margins come from. And clearly the sales growth brought in the additional margins that we have had uh, and other countermeasures that we have put in place and the sustained cost control measures which we continue to uh, push for uh, have helped us to get to an EBIT margin of 16.6% uh, in the first quarter. Having said that, the profit after tax, as you can see, uh, you know, has uh, uh, profit after tax uh, was at 13.2%, uh, as you can see here, which is clearly an 8.6% better than the preceding quarter and 48.4% uh, better uh, than the same quarter last year. Having said that, let me move on now to talk a little bit about the working capital management and uh, clearly what it tells you is the quarter had a tactical increase in our inventory levels uh, obviously riding on the back of market slowdown the demand going down so inventory levels did go up and uh, you know but this is definitely going to help us to also improve our service levels going forward throughout um, you know this was uh, one of the major reasons uh, that the working capital being higher uh, for the quarter at uh, 11,413 million rupees and uh, uh, at 19.9 percent .9 of sales was definitely higher when compared to the preceding quarters of the last year as such. Uh, so our capex spending obviously in the quarter one was definitely stronger when compared to uh, the last year Q1 as you can see and uh, we have inched up from 3.3 uh, percent of sales uh, last year to a 4.8 percentage of sales in terms of our capex investment which certainly is a clear direction that we are uh, focusing in growing more and more our export units. We did have a small setback on the free cash flow though for the first quarter which is more to do with the timing issue and, uh, and the working capitals that have increased as well. So as you can see, uh, while the first quarter we posted a negative 208 million, but we are confident coming into the second quarter that this will get reversed as well. So let me now move to the next slide, which is going to throw some light on the key performance indicators and uh, a quick snapshot on some of the performance uh, for your reference, as you can see. So revenue for the quarter stood at 15,675 million, which is clearly a growth of 19% uh, on a year on base, year basis and a 2.9% on a quarter on quarter basis. Having said that the EBITDA for the quarter was 3,107 million uh, and the EBITDA margin for the quarter was at 16.6% uh, uh, compared to the 16.6 of Q1 and the 19.4 of uh, Q4 2021. Uh, so the EBIT for the quarter was at 260 crores and the EBIT margin for the quarter stood at 19, sorry, am I right here? EBA, TDA 19.8 percent as compared to, yeah, and uh, the EBIT stood at 13 percent sorry, the EBIT stood at 16.6% yeah. for the quarter. So the profit after tax uh, for the quarter was at 13.2% and uh, clearly uh, we have been able to deliver reasonably good results in spite of the uh, major headwinds that we faced during the quarter. So moving on, um, I would like to touch upon a little bit on our uh, consistently improving uh, disclosures and transparencies in terms of our annual reporting as well. So we at Shackler India have started on the journey of integrated reporting in 2019 and uh, this is our third edition uh, and we will continue on the path of building uh, more comprehensive integrated reports in the coming years too. Now the report uh, is guided by the uh, IR framework issued by the erstwhile International Integrated Reporting Council uh, which is now the Value Reporting Foundation. Now to inform our stakeholders on all aspects of our business, we have introduced certain key elements of the uh, IR framework in the report and we will continue to add more such elements to reporting in our future editions. Now,
Now I would also like to inform you that the online report is now live in our website along with the PDF report which was earlier uploaded and we are progressively moving in the direction of reporting and trans with and disclosing our efforts, sustained efforts towards addressing all the six capitals that are required to be reported as well. Having said that, I come to now to the last slide of my presentation and uh, in summary, so as you can see, uh, the quarter gone by, our portfolio extension initiatives and key businesses contributed positively during the quarter. And our margins were backed by our constant focus on the deployed countermeasures and a balanced business mix as well. So we are on track with our CapEx strategy uh, as we have already invested uh, close to 75 crores in the quarter and the focus will remain on delivering our financial and operating matrices as expected. I'm also happy to share that we entered 2022 on a positive note and the first quarter has started off well for us. However, we are trading here cautiously as we move ahead given the current global events the rising inflation and supply chain disruptions. Uh, well, I come to the end of my presentation now, and uh, with this, I now open the floor for questions. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Our first question is from the line of Sham Sundar Sriram from Sundaram Mutual Fund. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, hi, sir. Uh, good morning. Um, um, uh, thank you for taking my question, sir. And uh, there uh, many congratulations on the very impressive uh, results per se. Um, so by, my first question is on the export front. Uh, we had outlined 1,000 crore capex to be spent over three years. We are also hearing the Scheffler parent shifting some of the lines to India per se. And even the last call you had, you had spoken about that India could be a sole supplier for some of the product lines therein. Um, just wanted to get a sense from you how much of this 1,000 crore capex is earmarked for, for exports. So that, uh, that, that would give us some directional uh, uh, trajectory in terms of where we are headed um, in terms of the exports per se. Uh, thank you, uh, Sam Sundar, for the, for the question. Uh, as regards your question about how much of the total capex uh, earmark for exports, uh, yes, uh, we have announced that we would uh, spend about 1,000 crore in three years. Uh, which is 2021 to 2024 uh, on capex uh, last year we spent 200 crore this year we are uh, planning to spend over 400 crores and over 400 crores also would be uh, spent uh, next year that is 2023 now as far as uh, allocation of this capex between different segments is concerned uh, for us it's very difficult to allot a figure to exports uh, reason being uh, quite a significant portion of this capex is going for the plant expansion, infrastructure, uh, construction of buildings, uh, as well as acquisition of some land uh, for our new plant. Uh, and uh, these plants are going to house the products both for domestic as well as export requirements. Relocated lines uh, from other part of Settler World to India is uh, the capex in the nature of plant and machinery. And there is additional investment for capex towards uh, exports for the new machineries uh, and the equipments. So it's very difficult to allot a number there, but yes, uh, we are increasing the share of the capex spent on uh, uh, exports or towards exports. Uh, the reason being the growth in export uh, is uh, envisaged as part of our strategy. What uh, revenue that you see in the quarter in terms of uh, exports is likely to uh, sustained uh, also for the future. Uh, we have relocation of the products uh, and we have also increasing demand uh, from the other uh, uh, parts of secular world. So therefore this area is going to remain in focus. 
and yes increasing capex also would be for uh, for for exports but it would be very difficult to uh, allot a particular figure for exports sure sir uh, i understand that so, so if i were to put it slightly differently we are at close to 250 odd crores in this quarter which is a 1000 crore annualized number per se um, are we seeing this to go towards a, say a 1500 odd crores in a in a in a three year time frame is that something that is visible based on the opportunity that you are seeing uh, from from the shefler parent there certainly there will be growth in exports uh, so it would be difficult to say whether it would reach 1500 crore but yes it would increase uh, and it would increase uh, uh, at least in double digits uh, going uh, forward Uh, and uh, that is actually going to build uh, in terms of the overall uh, export growth and uh, the thank you for that sir one other question under the pli scheme how much investments are earmarked under pli scheme and what categories does shefler intend to uh, expand uh, uh, products or category under the pli scheme uh, if you can uh, just spend a minute on that sir Yeah, thanks, Sham. Uh, see, the PLI scheme obviously, clearly, as an auto component uh, manufacturer, uh, you know, we are eligible. And if you look at the framework, this is for all the new technologies, uh, you know, uh, that are emerging now. That uh, you know, auto component manufacturers like us are eligible to compete with. So obviously, when you look at all the applications, uh, it is talking about uh, electric vehicle technologies. components and subsystems going into these applications as well as even the new emerging uh, technology of hydrogen fuel cells and uh, you know the works so having said that it's a very broad area and as you know shafler already has the capabilities to participate uh, both in the electric vehicle technology space as well as in the fuel cell and hydrogen space so with that uh, we are clearly uh, you know um preparing our strategies as well to 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 you know, play the game here we already have some actions on the ground uh in the succeeding uh, you know presentations as we come as as things begin to evolve we will definitely start to share that with you all so understood sir so the focus even from shefter will be on the on the on the new age technologies and the on the electrification and or the hydrogen fuel related uh, components yes okay so just on the electrification bit uh, earlier we were slightly more hesitant to to uh, you know put up capacities in motor manufacturing or uh, uh, or ecus etc given that you know uh, india market is yet to evolve we we were largely doing those transmission gear boxes uh, per se for the which we, that we have indigenized as well um uh, uh, that so uh, is there any change in thought process there uh, 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 specifically from an ev standpoint ev component standpoint there uh, from a shetla perspective well we follow the market is it not that's the right thing to do and uh, as the market is evolving uh, you know you do find definitely different subsets of technologies have started to come in and uh, clearly so we will be doing as well the course corrections if needed in terms of our strategy to bring out relevant products to address the relevant applications uh a year back uh, you know as you rightly know the fuel cell was not even talked about in india but now we begin to see a lot of action on the ground happening so accordingly you know we are an agile organization when we will continue to watch the market developments and clearly shift or keep shifting our strategies as well okay so even the motors etc which were erstwhile we were not thinking about that is also now under consideration set under the uh, given that there is an incentive under pli as well We, yes we will look at whatever possible possible options are there uh, that we can get into and competencies that we already have uh, in europe so we will try to bring obviously the market also has to have a demand and we believe now with the pli scheme coming in and uh, with the uh, measures that the government is putting in place to 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 uh, you know grow the electric vehicle technology in india and the early adopters we believe are the two and three wheelers so we believe that yes 
uh, there is enough and enough opportunity that is going to be there for us as well. So we have started to now work around it to see what we can offer, not just from a mechanical standpoint, but even from an electrical standpoint. Thank you, Mr. Shriram. Request you to join the queue for any follow-up as there are several participants waiting for their turn. Also, participants are requested to limit their question to two per participant. If time permits, you may join the queue for any follow-up. Thank you. We'll take the next question. That is on the line of Vimal Gohil from Union AMC. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, sir, uh, and congratulations uh, on a great set of numbers, sir. Uh, so just wanted to understand uh, uh, your margins, uh, margin performance better. Our exports currently are at 16-odd uh, percent. Uh, and we have a target of taking it to 20% of our total mix. Uh, and uh, assuming that you know there will be some uh, easing of raw material prices also uh, going forward, uh, your auto aftermarket will also probably do well, which is which I believe is a slightly higher margin business. It would it be fair to say that there is still some upside left in your margins uh, uh, going forward? So, Vimal, uh, just to correct uh, uh, one portion of your question where you mentioned uh, that there is a target to have 20% uh, as exports. Uh, we have not announced that we have a target of 20% exports. So, just uh, please stand corrected. Yes, exports would grow, but would it be 20% or would it stay at 15% or would it be in between? Very difficult to uh, sort of uh, uh, construe. So, uh, yes, there would be. We have the next question from the line of Sandeep Tulsian from GM Finance. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, good morning, sir. So my first question is... Uh, please go with the question. Yes. Yeah. Are you able to hear me? Yes. You're out of okay. So my first question is pertaining to uh, the industrial segment. Uh, we did mention in the comments that wind segment is facing some challenges uh, for uh, exports. Uh, but when we look at the breakup uh, for the industrial segment, uh, the non-mobility piece is actually done very well. I assume that uh, wind should be a, a large portion of that. So, if you could uh, clarify, uh, you know, what was the actual growth within wind segment, which is roughly 10% of your sales, and if that is not done well, uh, what are the other segments, and by what uh, proportion? Some more color, along with some color on the industrial mobility. Yeah, uh, thanks, Sandeep. And I just want to correct, make a small correction in what you said. Uh, well, uh, it's not the entire wind sector that is down. Uh, I, I, I did say that, yes, a few of our customers have uh, had some challenges on their export businesses, which has actually, uh, you know, in the first quarter, we saw the impact cascading down to us. Uh, but it does not mean that, uh, you know, this will get resolved, we are hoping, and uh, once the problem issues get resolved on the export front, uh, surely I think this will be back on track. So that's the first thing. So it's only a few customers that we have encountered this challenge. Uh, second
Initially, yes, wind was down, although it contributes roughly about uh, 11 percent to our total sales. Uh, well, in this quarter, if one were to look at from the preceding quarter itself, our business came down close to 14 percent. And that's one of the reasons the impact on the industrial side, uh, because, uh, you know, on the over, overall Shackler India sales, wind is about 11 percent. Uh, then, and and that, that definitely was, uh, that pulled down the industrial part of the business. You said right that the other uh, non-mobility sectors did well, yes, uh, you know, the uh, other sectors like industrial automation, the raw materials, uh, we did definitely have some strong performance there coming in, uh, you know, for the quarter, definitely we saw some strong numbers coming in there. And, and, and just to add uh, one uh, point, Harsa, uh, as far as our segmentation, uh, in others uh, segment, uh, we have in addition to wind, uh, we have raw material business, uh, business in industrial automation as well as power transport. transmission. And the business uh, in uh, industrial automation did well. So there is significant growth in industrial yeah. automation raw material. as well as in the raw material business. So that does co actually contribute to growth yeah. uh, in the uh, non-mobility uh, space. Understood, that's clear. And uh, second question was uh, pertaining to this uh, CPV growth, which we usually give an update on. Uh, you mentioned the last quarter it was around 40 euros per vehicle. Long term target is to double this uh, CPV growth. Uh, if you can uh, just uh, update us where you are in that journey, how soon we intend to reach there. And one related question uh, within auto towards aftermarket is, uh, we have been introducing a lot of these products, like uh, in addition to true power lubricants and now uh, the wipers uh, within auto aftermarket what would be the split between traded versus manufactured uh, products if you could just highlight or is it entirely traded uh, those are two questions on automotive thank you okay let me let me first uh, answer the question on the cpv uh, as i said earlier that yes we will continue to to focus on increasing the content per vehicle and with all the new business events that we are securing uh, we are we are well on track to continue to grow that and uh, certainly we have seen improvements when uh, coming into this year when compared to last year uh, now if you were to ask me to give a number here well uh, i definitely we see improvements in uh, some specific uh, segments we have seen very strong growth in the cpv uh, some of the segments for strategic reasons we are still having uh, you know a flattish growth rate but we are addressing that as well so it all boils down to some of the new business wins which as soon as the projects come to a realization the cpv certainly is going to improve there as well uh, so we are on course and we will stay the course for the content per vehicle number. Uh, the second part of your question was uh, as regards the second part of the question out of aftermarket business, ah, automotive okay. aftermarket, how much is manufactured, how much is traded? The answer is uh, we have largely manufacturing okay. in automotive aftermarket business. Automotive business is also, OE business is also largely, it is nearly 100% uh, uh, local or manufactured. And aftermarket business, I would say over 90% is, uh, is, is manufactured. So just to add uh, to what Satish just said, as we know, the Shaffler 2 Power was launched end of 2020. And 2021 was the first year we really saw, uh, you know, the traction in terms of the new products that we have started to launch. Uh, our focus is to continue to add more products and grow the percentage of the Shaffler 2 Power business that we do. Uh, with respect to the own manufacturer, but today, as Satish rightly says, uh, close to 90, 90 yeah. percent and above is continues to be our bread and butter products. And with the extend range extension, this ratio would uh, would, would slightly yeah. change. Yes, uh, the trading uh, would increase. Yeah. Got it. Thank you so much for taking the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is in the line of Sachin Maniar from Inquired Research. Please go ahead. 
Hi, sir. Good morning. Uh, uh, thanks for my uh, um, for my turn and uh, congratulations for a good set of numbers. So, my first question is on the export front. Uh, so, can you uh, broadly see how the composition in exports for auto and industrial market? Uh, I think so. Eighty percent is goes into mobility, but if we say how it divided for auto and industrial, and how would be the end exposure to the Asia, Europe, and US uh, on the exports front? And if you can just highlight what would be the margin differential for exports versus company level margin. That one first point on exports, Mark. So exports largely for industrial business. So our exports are, as you know, automotive business is highly localized, and I think that's the that's how the automotive model works. Model works actually, yes. So automotive business is largely localized. So our exports are largely for uh, for industrial business. In fact, over ninety percent would be industrial business only. Uh, and in terms of uh, geogra uh, geographical uh, spread, it is more or less balanced now. So we have a business of exports, Europe, North America, and Asia Pacific. And all these three would be more or less similar. Uh, yes, Europe uh, would be highest, uh, So and uh, North America and Asia Pacific would be uh, slightly lower than that in terms of the share of the pie. Mm. So that's how the whole, whole whole structure is. And we do have exports also to China, a certain portion of exports to China. So it's more or less balanced across the uh, across the uh, continents. So if you can highlight mar the margin differential for exports and company level margins, it's possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was about to come to that, uh, answering that question, so I was thinking for a moment. Mm -hmm. So we do not have a specific number to talk to uh, to inform you about the exact margins for uh, for exports. And uh, let me also uh, clarify in this regard that it's not that we do not wish to share, we are more than happy to share. But our whole segmentation works on broadly mobility and uh, others. And that's how we normally have the uh, internal uh, monitoring, reporting system, as well as overall business, driving the business. So we do not have a specific segment called exports, and we do not have that sort of uh, you know profitability uh, to even internally monitor. But yes, we have certain projects which are specific to exports, the projects right from the uh, feasibility till the final realization is monitored based on the target uh, profitability as well as the target uh, realization of that project and this happens for all uh, across uh, the segments. So yes, there is a focus uh, on earnings across segments, but there is no specific number that we have for exports that, uh, that we can say with you. Sure. So, and the second point is, uh, just few quarters back, you have given a breakup that 60% of is you are bearing and 40% is non-bearing. Uh, if you can see what, if there's so many products introduced, what would be the current uh, breakup would be between bearings and non-bearings? And we could throw, what would be the ENA and look uh, revenues in CY20, so that would give some idea on it. So as far as breakup is concerned, that still remains more or less in that range, 60-40 mm -hmm. only. Maybe that has, that would have only a couple of percentage uh, uh, change from 60-40. So it is more or less in that range. Uh, your second question is, ENA and look range, how much is the overall revenue uh, within the total uh, pie, right? That's the second yes, question. Sir. Yeah, so ENA and look together, I would say, contribute about 50% of our total business. So 50% is uh, uh, FAG. Brand. Approximately, I don't have the figures in front of me, but yes, it is almost 50 50. Okay, sir. And so finally, on the, on the CapEx front, uh, we already explained. So, just to put a key, uh, how would we divide it uh, between auto industries? In the terms that uh, uh, parent has declared that uh, their 68% uh, is powertrain specific and 32 is power agnostic, how would it be for India and would your capex is largely on power agnostic product and how power trains or power trains per second and if there is a risk uh, that the electrification catch up would that uh, risk to the uh, capex what we are putting that's uh, just a last question thanks yeah so as regard the uh, investments or the capex that we have here market is more or less balanced uh, between industrial and automotive business uh, the investment that we have for this year and at least the next year is largely for the advanced technologies as well as conventional products. So little more uh, share of the capex uh, would be going to industrial business. However, the investments from uh, next to next year onwards would be 
more oriented towards automotive business and coming there exactly about your question about uh, the e-mobility or the non-conventional products there, uh, I would request Harsa to uh, provide some sort of a comments on that. Yeah, uh, on the business front, uh, you know, today the e-mobility side roughly contributes 3% uh, of our sales. Uh, and I can say that um, looking at the market development on the electric vehicles, uh, you know, when you stack up the numbers, you will find the market too is around 2% in the passenger vehicle segment. And clearly, uh, we are in line with, or if not a little better than the market development as well, in terms of the volume of business. Now, uh, look at the technology, yes, a um, lot of it is still the conventional products, but uh, certainly we are working with our customers to bring out, uh, you know, new technologies and new offerings and uh, in the electric vehicle space as well. Uh, we are looking at uh, two-wheelers and three-wheelers, which are the early adopters, and uh, certainly we see the potential there to start, uh, you know, uh, developing solutions as well as make investments uh, look very promising there and that's exactly our focus area right now while on the other hand uh, the passenger vehicles the volume still remain pretty low and uh, nevertheless but uh, definitely we do have the competency and uh, uh, technology to bring out solutions for the electric vehicle applications uh, be it the passenger vehicles or otherwise uh, within the Schaffler portfolio it's just a question of now uh, uh, adapting those technologies to Indian needs, and that customization is something that we will continue to try. Sure, sure. Thanks, sir. That's all. Thank you. And also because of the PLI scheme, sorry, uh, yeah, just yeah. to add one more, uh, the the mix of the capex would change because we are Correct. also because focusing the, on certain yeah. advancement and of the capex in that uh, line with the PLI. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is on the line of Ankit Merchant from Quest Investments. Please go ahead. Hello. Yep. Yes. Yes, Mr. Merchant. My first question is related to the breakup in the automotive yeah. segment. Can you uh, give a breakup? Uh, how much is two wheelers, uh, passenger vehicles, and TV? Oh, you mean um, in terms of sales? Yes. Yeah, in terms of revenue, I think you want broadly vehicle uh, segment uh, split. Mm -hmm. uh, I can say broadly, uh, say two-wheeler business is within our industrial business. And if I look at the overall total revenue, which includes uh, automotive as well, uh, two-wheeler would be about 7%. But if I take only the industrial business where this sector is, uh, accounted, uh, it's about double of that, so 14% of that revenue and 7% uh, of overall revenue. Okay, uh, PVs and CVs would be the uh, would be the uh, would be uh, just a moment if we, if we can track if we can trace it out in a moment we can share. Otherwise, I would uh, request uh, our investor relation officer to provide this uh, information to you uh, separately. Yeah, at later point of time. The second question is related to the, you know, the uh, EU uh, free trade agreement, which is going to get signed in couple of, uh, you know, couple of days or so. So, uh, what are your thoughts, and how could Schaeffler benefit out of it? Australia. Is this to do with the FTA with Australia? No, no, no. The Europe. Europe. Okay. Absolutely. It's it's still evolving. Yeah. Still evolving, and not so much progress, I would say. Uh, in fact, we have been also right uh, pitching for this. Uh, certainly, we we are eager as well because this would open up different channels of uh, business, and as well as it would ease a lot of uh, you know um, constraints that we face today yeah. uh, with the free trade agreement. Certainly, we are eager because our uh, traded part of the business is also substantially large. Yeah. So that's going to benefit as well, and our exports definitely would benefit as well. Both ways, it works both ways for us. And in the Europe, I think Europe contributes 40% uh, of our exports. So in that particular, uh, you know, geography itself, what are the current challenges that you are facing? And uh, how is this particular, uh, you know, geography as such going to get impacted for you? So our exports are largely to Western part of Europe. 
Germany and other Western countries, not so much in Eastern part of Europe. So far, we have not encountered any major the challenge. only challenges that I would put on the table is uh, the COVID, as a result yeah. of which there is some uh, impact was felt. Now, with the geopolitical developments in that part of the world, definitely we see uh, some impact. But the good thing is um, we do export to the other parts of the world as yeah. well, and uh, that's beginning to also look up for us. Asia Pacific also we find a lot of opportunities. So while export to the to Europe, uh, I wouldn't say it's muted, but then we are watching it carefully uh, with the situation that is developing there. Uh, but I would say there are enough and enough opportunities for us. Thank you, Mr. Mochan. Request to join the queue for any follow-ups. We have a next question from the line of Vimal Gohil from Union AMC. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity once again, sir. My apologies. My line got disconnected before. Uh, sir, so uh, basically my second question was on, uh, you mentioned something on uh, uh, reallocation of some product lines from your parent entity. Uh, I am not aware of the same. Could you please uh, help me understand this better? So those were the industrial uh, sort of business, uh, some of the relocation of some of the lines. And uh, those were in the space of, uh, of uh, just a moment, please. Mainly, uh, we were talking yeah. about uh, products. Yeah. So those were mainly on the space of uh, large size uh, uh, bearings, as well as CRBs, double bearings for railways, uh, then large size bearings uh, for wind applications, tech bearings for machine tool applications, uh, and TRBs uh, for uh, heavy commercial vehicles. Yeah. Uh, predominantly, the uh, relocation that is being done is for bearings. Yeah, uh, that's most of the relocations right. that are happening, and uh, also catering to different uh, sectors, so to say, industrial automation definitely is one of them. Uh, rail and wind is also on the uh, you know agenda for us to bring in those product lines here. Right, so basically this will incrementally contribute to our uh, exports business going forward. One of the drivers there. Uh, this yeah, is it's going to contribute mainly to the mainly that, right. Okay, got it. Uh, yeah. So, uh, sir, just wanted to get an update. Uh, you, uh, The company had signed a MOU with the Tamil Nadu government on setting up a plant. Uh, I'm sure that uh, 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 the understanding that is there is that that plant will be for the PLI scheme. Uh, just wanted to get an update on where are we, have we purchased the land, or has the construction started? When can we see the commissioning of uh, that new plant? Yeah, so we have acquired, uh, we have uh, signed the MOU, and we are planning to acquire the land uh, during this year. Uh, and we are expecting to actually, or planning to commission the product, uh, the the plant next year. So that's our plan. Uh, and uh, as regards your PLI, uh, there is no specific plan that we have assigned to PLI uh, because then PLI, that one. Uh, good thing for PLI is that uh, you have to have certain uh, uh, threshold uh, investment uh, and uh, sales uh, realized, and that investment can be in any of the plant. So it has to be within the company. So we have uh, no doubt large amount of that investment would be towards that, uh, but there would be investments in other plants also, uh, which are going to be for the products which are actually for uh, are going to be eligible for PLI. Got it, sir. Uh, rest of the questions have been answered. Thank you so much, uh, and all the very best for uh, 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is in the line of Rishi Vora from Kotak Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, sir, for giving me the opportunity, and congratulations on a good set of numbers. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is uh, you highlighted that 60% uh, of your revenues come from the bearing segment. Uh, if you could further, uh, you know, dissect it on like how much comes from engine bearings, uh, wheel transmission chases, that would be helpful. That would be very difficult. We can provide you very approximate, but we don't want to go wrong there. So I, I would suggest that this question also be, you know, answered separately by our head of investor uh, relations to you. You will get a reply for weeks. 
Yeah, sir. Uh, and on the export beat, uh, export part, you said that you know hundred almost most of it's uh, industrial. So, like, what are the products uh, which you export, and like, what is the end consumers? Who are your end consumers in that segment? Uh, I think the Satish answered the question. <laughs> yeah, I already actually answered previously. The previous question was uh, regards to products uh, which I answered, and just once yeah. again I repeat that the, as far as products are concerned, they are largely uh, bearings uh, in the bearing space, uh, both small and large size bearings, and medium size bearings. So we have CRBs, TRBs, DGBBs, then Terol bearings, uh, then large size bearings up to 2000 mm. Then we have stack bearings and certain small bearings for robotic applications, as well as axial uh, taper roller bearings for uh, uh, the machine tool uh, uh, applications. So those are the uh, actually products uh, that go for uh, for exports and uh, largely for uh, for uh, largely bearings only. Right. And this large size bearings which we export uh, from India are also completely manufactured in India, or is there any traded component? No, whatever we have exports here, that is entirely uh, manufactured in India only. Yes. Okay. In fact, we, we have certain, yeah. uh, certain maybe you know components uh, would be uh, imported. Where again we are working on localizing the components. And when we are even working for for the localization, so what we call as true localization, yeah. so localization of finished goods as well as depth of localization, include inclusive of the components. Yeah, uh, okay, understood. Uh, and last bit on uh, on export front only. Why are we not uh, in the automotive segment? Is there any specific reason for that, or maybe over time we will focus on that segment as well? The point is that let me clarify once again that automotive space across the globe is a localized uh, uh, sort of a, uh, you know uh, manufacturing. Whichever country you go, automotive production and auto component. Is largely localized because OEs expect, uh, you know, just in time deliveries. OEs expect based in class uh, service level that can only be ensured if you have the local manufacturing. So, this is a very common parlance across the globe, and that's how it works also in auto component sector in India. And we have our automotive and both automotive OE as well as automotive aftermarket largely localized. Yeah, there is some space in automotive aftermarket. Uh, where we have imports because of the uh, expansion of the product range, because of the uh, uh, you know new product uh, uh, launches and the range expansion. Otherwise, uh, automotive is largely uh, uh, localized. A very very small portion in our export is contributing from automotive. Uh, understood. Thank you, sir. Uh, all the best. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, due to paucity of time, we'll be able to take one last question. That is from the line of Chaitanya Shah from Silver Line Capital. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for giving me the opportunity. Uh, I, uh, you know, coming to export, I had a, uh, I had question generally, you know, from the entire Sheffler group side, including the parent. Now, uh, more than 50 to 60 percent of the manufacturing capacity of the parent is in Europe, so. Internally, is there, uh, you know, any target of what can come to India or possibly, you know, are you guys working uh, with a target of what portion of that can come to India? And uh, uh, again with that, you know, because of the geopolitical situation, there are a lot of talks of, you know, supply chain reconfiguration going on. So I just want to understand where does India stand in terms of priority of setting up a, you know, significant uh, manufacturing base for the parent outside of Europe? So, so, so look, uh, the whole, uh, uh, whether you talk about exports or you talk about relocation, the whole phenomenon works basis competence, right? So we in India, amongst uh, the entire Safler group, have competence for certain range of products, have established both cost and technical competence, and therefore those products are localized. Those products are also manufactured in other part of the world, but are actually relocated to India because of precisely because of this competence. Same thing is happening for certain other range of products also. It's not that India is getting all the products of Settler, uh, and that's just not possible. So we have competence established for certain range of products in some other part of the world, and those countries have actually uh, manufacturing and relocation there, and thereby the overall cost 
and the competence uh, is actually improved uh, across the group. Now, uh, coming to these geopolitical conditions, uh, as uh, Harsa also mentioned before, that we have our exports spread across the globe. It's not only for uh, Europe. It's for Europe, for Americas, and as well as for Asia Pacific. And therefore, this geopolitical condition is no doubt a risk, but that could not be a significant risk uh, in terms of uh, achieving what we have targeted for our exports, as well as what Safler has globally targeted for different relocations ac across the sector world. Okay, all right. And and um, my uh, last question is, uh, you know, if if you could give some, uh, you know, if you could elaborate a bit on, uh, you know, some of the technologies in the EV space uh, that you're working on, you know, if you could give some case studies, uh, it could either be at the parent level or at the Indian company level. Uh, if you could give some case studies on the kind of technology in the EV space that you're working on, that would be great. Okay. Uh, I, you know, there are uh, quite a few areas uh, that uh, Schaffler globally is working on. Uh, if I were to start with the automotive side, uh, well, uh, the electric vehicle technology, uh, wherein we are talking about uh, manufacturing high power density motors uh, for the, um, you know, e-axles. So that's that's the competency that Schaeffler already has, and we've been already into series production of motors there in Europe for European market. Uh, talking about controllers that go with that, uh, motors as well, that's the competency we have brought in as well. And uh, moving forward, uh, we also made uh, specific acquisitions and brought those competencies even on the industrial side. Uh, with the high level of automation that's coming into the uh, you know, industrial applications, uh, manufacturing areas, uh, robotics is one of the sectors that we see good demand growing in. So strategic acquisitions towards uh, products that go into robotic arms uh, is also now within the Schaeffler portfolio, uh, talking about planetary gearboxes that go into these robotic arms. Uh, we now have the competence and the wherewithal to design and develop uh, specific solutions there. Uh, talk about uh, digitalization uh, on the industry 4.0, uh, state of new products in terms of uh, lubrication systems and uh, condition monitoring uh, both now have been brought into the market and we are now aggressively uh, you know uh, offering this to our customers both in India and outside India as well so uh, there is every aspect of the business uh, we, we see that uh, Shafla has the capabilities and appropriate strategies and uh, strategically appropriate products are being brought out uh, in those relevant areas. I hope I am answered to given you a flavor of that. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question for today. I now hand the conference over to Ms. Gauri Kamper for closing comments. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we now conclude this call. If you have any further queries, please do reach out to me on gaudi.kanikarachrafla.com. Thank you. I have a good day. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Shaffler India Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you all for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines. Thank, Thank you. you.